Good afternoon. I'm Don Gray, the program's artist and critic, and today you are very fortunate people out here because we have with us one of the foremost American painters of the 20th century, and I'm sure will be so considered of all time, Mr. Jack Levine, the painter of many, many different kinds of paintings from political and social protests through mythological paintings and figures, portraits, and so forth. Mr. Levine, uh, you're going to be having uh, a show at the Kennedy Gallery here in New York City opening November 8th. Uh, could you tell us what time period and uh, the work will cover and how many works will be in it and kinds of work and so forth? Uh, I would recommend a poster I did, which is at the Levine Exhibition 1972. So this would be the work in the last three years. It would be paintings and drawings. Let's say works on canvas and works on paper, because sometimes I've used oil on paper, sometimes right. pastel, right. sometimes just drawings. And uh, uh, I don't know how many things I have, but uh, I, I hope that uh, everybody that hears me will come see it. Oh, I'm sure they will. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to miss it. I'm sure a lot of people feel the same way about your work. Uh, how do you feel with the stature that you have, the stature as an artist that you have had since the 1930s, to, and your reputation as one concerned with human values, human dignity and so forth. How do you feel as an artist in a time where the paint roller is king and impersonality seems to be the uh, key word in art today? Well, I disconnect from it. Uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, I, uh, I, I find that uh, there's no relationship between uh, what's so pre prevalent in avant-garde circles and what I do. So I tend not to go and I tend not to refer to it. I do my own thing and uh, that's about it. Is it, it, it seems to me, uh, uh, a fairly isolated and, and lonely position. Uh, do you feel cut off from the art world and your fellow artists in that sense, even though they seem to be a different breed than you? Well, I, I have some associates that believe as I do, but for the most part, uh, uh, that great art world out there is something I, I let severely alone. And uh, I find I don't need it. I mean, uh, I think the shoe is on the other foot. I, I pity some of these uh, pure quintessential types that can't refer to anything on earth. But, but just, the, uh, just the manipulation of some, some simple, severe geometry, there really isn't enough to do. I would go mad in the studio if that's all I had to work with. That has always seemed to me a, a, almost a total ivory tower art, a complete withdrawal and retreat from reality and, and feelings and, and everything else, just uh, isolated totally uh, with your canvas and your aesthetics and saying nothing about people or the human condition. You've mentioned that in the past, or even now really, that you follow what you call the Rembrandt Trail. Could, could you tell us what, what you mean by that? Oh, well, the, the Rembrandt trail is simply a matter of going on the trail of Rembrandts wherever they are to see them, that's all. I mean, uh, uh, Ruth Gieco, my wife, and I, for example, went to Germany. We went to, we went to uh, a place called Braunschweig or Brunswick, which I think has nothing in it except one great Rembrandt. <laughs> There's a kind of moth-eaten Vermeer, which is which uh, with a little uh, conditioning would be, would be uh, just grand. But this Rembrandt is magnificent and it's worth a visit. That's the Rembrandt Trail. And is it more or less a, a trail of spiritual and artistic resuscitation to come in contact with art that says something to you in opposition to art today that uh, is meaningless, essentially meaningless to you? Oh, I see. Well, Rembrandt says something to me that, that uh, no contemporary art says, especially since the death of Picasso, there's hardly a chance that, uh, uh, that I, I mean, he, incidentally, I don't feel that the time gap between Rembrandt and us is so great either. I think it's ridiculous, the, uh, uh, the difference between, let's say, uh, 1640 or so and 1975 is just a moment in time. I don't know why it's, uh, it's looked at with such a narrow gauge and, uh, and uh, 
uh, why we're told so severely to let, the, let all that area alone. And uh, it's a little ridiculous. Well, it, it has reached the point, hasn't it, in our own time, that there are many people who uh, anything pre-Jackson Pollock, anything pre-mid-1940s is uh, outdated and of no concern to a the artists of today. Right, and, and since almost everything is pre-Jackson Pollock, at least in our field, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't leave the artist with much. I pity anybody whose who's work drive depends on, on the date on the calendar. Uh, I once said, and uh, caused a lot of irritation, that, oh, something like this, uh, contemporaneity for its own sake fills me with horror. I said, uh, I think that the thing to do is to bring back the great tradition, whatever is great about it. Uh, I, I irritated a lot of people. They, they seem to feel somehow or other that, that, it's, uh, that it's, a, uh, uh, it's an attack on progress somehow or other, as though there are two sides. There's a progressive avant-garde thing, and there's a, let me see if I can say it, a retardeur. Uh, old fusty spirit which always threatens to overwhelm it. Uh, whereas that's not, the, that's not the problem at all. I mean that's a very, that's an abstraction within an abstraction. It's become a question of not what is avant-garde but what is fashionable in, in almost a cliche sense, isn't it? That's what you're saying when you're talking about contemporaneity, aren't you? Yes. I, the fashion of the moment. Yes. I, everything before. I think I'm a member of a rising army which considers uh, avant-garde the academy, the official academy. It's, uh, uh, I mean, Nelson Rockefeller is very happy with it. And I, who am instinctively sort of a rebellious man, I'm un unhappy with it. So what have we got? And we'll see how unhappy and uh, what a re rebel indeed Mr. Levine is in just a moment when we look at some of his works, both early and uh, some that will be in the show at the Kennedy Galleries opening November 8th here in New York, of course. Uh, one, one more question, uh, Mr. Levine, concerning uh, what we probably both agree is the decay of the mod of modern art today, the majority of art produced. Does that decay reflect the uh, decay of the artists themselves and their lack of any insight or creative drive, or is it reflective of society's decay at large? No. I think it sort of reflects society's decay at large, but I'm not competent to talk about that. I think art perhaps has a bit of a Svengali trilby relationship between the, uh, the art critics and or historians and the artists. I think artists, unfortunately, tend to be programmed by others rather than find their own expression. I think uh, that's the trouble. Yeah. So that uh, it's, well, let me, you're, you're saying that it's a breakdown in the artists themselves. I, I suppose so. I, I, I would say something else, which is that the artist is supposed to be a prophet, a seer, or something like that. And uh, I think the longest tradition we have is the court artist, the court painter. And I think we're seeing what court painting is today. That's uh, beautifully put. You're saying that the artist is the court painter to the corporation and bureaucracy? Yes. Technology. Then. Yes. And to banks and whatnot, yes. Yeah, I've never heard it phrased that way. I happen to believe that myself, but I never thought of it in terms of, of court, the court, the contemporary court painter, but it's, it's beautifully put. Uh, maybe we can go, begin with this very well-known picture on the left here. Uh, <coughs> Jack, painted by Jack Levine in 1937, uh, The Feast of Pure Reason. What emotion inspired you to create this painting? I suppose emotions of anger and fear. This was done around 1937, and, uh, and I, uh, I was afraid of what uh, Franklin Roosevelt called the Bourbons, the rich Bourbons who uh, who would cut me off without a penny. And, uh, and of gangsters and, and politicians and, and the sort of brute force that, uh, that it seemed to me I saw during the 30s in Boston. And I, so I painted this picture. And the title comes out of uh, Ulysses Knight, 
night scene. It's a kind of a night town scene. It's a kind of a drunken situation where Stephen Dedalus loses his cane and, Le and Leopold Bloom gives it back to him and, and Dedalus says, stick, what need I have of a stick in this feast of pure reason? I mean, it's, it's just a uh, kind of a satirical remark about all the violence that's going on. What, what, in, what, what inspired you? How did you originally move in this direction to be uh, angered by and disquieted by and react to social injustice and corruption? Uh, so many of us just pass it by and ignore it. What, what made you fix on it, so to speak? Well, you must see that there was a spirit in the land in the 1930s, very much like the last phase we had in the 60s. I don't think it was as silly as the Abby Hoffman movements. I think it was based more on, on uh, uh, a real program, let's say, of organizing the trade unions on the one hand and a real fear of what was going on in Spain and, and the oncoming war, which came on. And uh, I mean, it cost me three and a half years of my life, that war did, and I was, and I was very legitimately afraid of it. So uh, I, I think that uh, uh, it was a uh, nervous condition that was called for under the circumstances, and that's what I tried to paint. And very successfully. In a very, very, you know, uh, the, I keep saying very well-known picture by Jack Levine, who will be exhibiting at the Kennedy Galleries starting November 8th. Uh, Post-war picture, one of the few, really, I guess, that Mr. Levine painted about the war, entitled Welcome home. Uh, Mr. Levine, you have mentioned that this caused a furor in the Eisenhower administration. Would you care to discuss that and the inspiration for this picture? Yes, uh, I, I could say a few words about it. The thing is that uh, the House on american Affairs Committee was, uh, was really beating up on, on uh, people in the arts. But they were not interested in uh, and people who were disconnected, unpatronized, and unsponsored. Uh, so they went through the uh, uh, they went through the film business with a fiery sword, and the uh, and all the broadcasting businesses, and 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 everything which showed, uh, let's say, a high level of, of social organization. Us, they let alone because we went with a dam. Uh, the trouble is that that some committee out of the State Department wanted to have an exhibition of American art in Moscow. So right away the House on American Affairs Committee had the State Department o over the, uh, uh, over the what you may call it. And they went after, they went after this with all their might. And uh, they found all kinds of communists and fellow travelers among us artists. Although as uh, somebody pointed out, maybe the New York Times, you know, what harm could we do with the Russians? You know, whom could we convert if we were? In any case, uh, I was in Europe at the time, but I read in the Rome Daily American or, or the Paris Tribune or something like that, that there was a subpoena out for me. They wanted me to come to Washington and they wanted to talk to me about, about my uh, political leanings. And uh, I didn't like the idea of being met by a subpoena when I, when I got back to, it was then, of course, Idlewild. But fortunately, a, uh, a main newspaper woman named May Craig at a press conference that President Eisenhower gave, said, Mr. Eisenhower, what do you think of this painting by Jack Levine, Welcome Home? He said, he said it's a lampoon, he said. It's, a not, it's not your work of art in a true sense although I'm not giving a fair transcript of what he said because it was full of sentences interrupting sentences and <laughs> predicates getting mixed up with subjects and so forth. He had, he, he had uh, bless him, uh, a very complex expression. Complex and <laughs> opaque. So. Yeah, you're being complimentary there. Well, it was a terrific rumpus. In, uh, uh, the Times had editorials saying, uh, let's not make a pasta neck out of this guy, you know, and uh, I must say the art world held together and, and I got very good support. And uh, in, in Moscow, where the show was up, they were counting pictures because they assumed that uh, they'd pull this painting down if the president were displeased with it. Oh yes, Edith Halpert, who was the curator of the American paintings uh, in Moscow at that time, 
uh, got very angry at what Eisenhower had said, and she said, a lot of people don't like his painting either. <laughs> so the Russians expected that she would be fired. She wasn't fired, the painting was, t was not taken down, which was, uh, which was a kind of interesting lesson for them as well as for us. What happened is it wiped out the Un-American Affairs Committee. I mean, with this rumpus, they couldn't get a line in the papers, and they dropped the whole thing. I didn't get a subpoena. I was free and clear. And you had a lot of impact, probably, on a Russian's awareness of how democracy works. There's a lot of, uh, what do you call it, uh, signifying nothing, a lot, in, in a sense, when you, when you stir up a tempest in a teapot, in a sense, that everybody would get upset over the picture. Somewhere I have in the back of my mind a quotation, from such hopes you could die, but <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, same thing. Uh, in, in the picture, by the way, there is this beautiful portrait of the, perhaps the general's wife. What, what are you saying about the bored quality of some of the women who associate with quote, unquote, great men? She is absolutely stupid, in a stupefied sense of, of just almost ingrown, embittered some, somehow. I can't feel that. I like Betty Ford, too, you know. I, I love Betty Ford. Yeah, I, what she right. said, what she said at the press conference. So I'm not about to talk about that. Okay. It just, uh, I, I had a lot of ideas about, about how vulnerable people looked when they were chewing, regardless of whom they were. So... Uh, oh, you mean she's just chewing? She's not... Uh, uh, this lady is... Uh, well, it may, she's, she's perhaps mincing very delicately, I don't know. <laughs> You're being very gracious toward her. I, I think there was a, a much more fiery comment involved there, perhaps. Uh, well, this is public. My paintings aren't there. Oh, I get it. Okay. <laughs> so go, go to the Kennedy Gallery November 8th and get the real scoop on Jack Levine's works. Another one of the great uh, paintings of the period is the gangster's funeral. Uh, Mr. Levine, what is the inspiration for this uh, work? Well, I had to speak at the Museum of Modern Art, which I consider enemy territory. <laughs> and uh, the topic was uh, some modern artists on art of the past. And uh, I, I delivered a kind of uh, attack on contemporary, or modern art rather. I have no quarrel with contemporary art. It's modernism. That, that uh, I was talking about. And I, uh, I read a paper about uh, how important human drama was to me in painting. And uh, the paper was to celebrate the, dra uh, the dramatists in the history of art. And uh, by way of illustration, I wrote a little libretto on the painting I was going to do. I mean, since they were pushing dope on the street and whatnot, I thought I would paint a gangster funeral which I described in this speech. And uh, then I was nervy enough to paint it. And uh, the, uh, it was purchased by a neighboring museum. And of course, the neighboring museum is uh, the Whitney, of course. Well, it was then a neighboring museum. Yeah, now, and uh, I suppose they are <coughs> neighbors in spirit still, perhaps, in, in many ways. Uh, we could go now to the uh, cha a little change of pace in terms of medium, uh, a very beautiful, sensitive drawing of two rabbis, I, I presume, done at what age, Mr. Levine? I was 15 when I did that, so that was done 45 years ago. And uh, I just want to show it. It is on exhibition now in New York, as it happens. There is a, an exhibition at the Jewish Museum, which opened the other night. And uh, so that's why I thought it would be relevant to mention. I think in many material ways, my work hasn't changed much in the last 45 years. Uh, some of these interests are uh, interests I still have. I hope I've improved a bit, but I think it's not bad. Uh, that is the understatement of the uh, decade, at least. When you look at the sensitivity of the drawing, it, it reminds us of other young artists of genius, uh, Toulouse-Lautrec drawing with amazing uh, power and sensitivity at the age of 12 and so forth. It, it's just incredible that you could draw so well at such an age. Uh, I, it's, it's a silly, stupid question, but how, how did you manage that, to, to draw so well at such an early age? It, I mean, it came naturally through work, I suppose. But well, I worked very hard, yeah. But 
the, the point I want to make is that I was not prepared to give up whatever it was at the behest of, of the, the pilot of some spaceship, which is the avant-garde. I mean, why should I? Why should I change my course because uh, I'm browbeaten and bullied into it? it it's, uh, uh, I have my own continuity and I have my own lifetime to consider and to pace myself. And I can't sim simply uh, think in terms of focusing on the locomotive of, of uh, avant-garde art history. Maybe I'll hit for a couple of years and get washed up. It is inhuman and it is not uh, in any way uh, 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 it is not in any way programmed, spaced, with any allowance for, for uh, anyone's lifetime or life's work or anything like that. This is a part of the, uh, the nonsensical aspect of, uh, of the avant-garde. You cl click with the fashionable uh, work for a moment, maybe a, a season or two, and yeah. then you're uh, down the drain to oblivion with no sense yeah. of a continuing expression of your personal uh, needs, really, and a continuing yes. deep fundamental uh, expression of yourself. I heard a young man, a hard edge painter, uh, who was apparently hitting it uh, at a given time, and he was asked, what do you do when, when this little sensation of yours is over? He said, he said, when this comes to an end, he says, boy, I just, I just, I'm going to be man enough to take it. Oh, that's pathetic. So futile and pathetic, that's yes. That's pathetic. To have no sense of art meaning anything more than he's going to, that, I don't think he was ever a man in the first place to have, have begun it, to uh, well, join joined the fashionable surge. It's puny. Uh, Mr. Levine, your next picture here is uh, the Spanish prisoner. Could you comment on that? Well, I, I think I included it because, uh, uh, understandably, the, the, uh, the social storm and drang of the 1930s is, is not what it was, and there, there were, there were three, way, three ways you can go from there, or I could go from there. The first is to, is to go on doing it, and, and the second is to, is to extend it in some way, and, uh, and, uh, expand it so I can, I can see my life as uh, in terms of human involvement and even social and political involvement. And the third is to repudiate it entirely and uh, in, in a way the life principle is also repudiated if you do that. Well much the same comment I think would apply here to the next picture here in 63 was it? Of Birmingham. Yes. Birmingham 1963. Yes it was uh, at a time when they were uh, turning hoses and dogs on, on the, uh, on the uh, black people down there that were fighting for their, their rights. And uh, finally, I was motivated to do that. I, uh, I don't think anybody means to say that because the, uh, the political uh, and social considerations of the 1930s were over that th this did not happen. Yeah, exactly. Or this should be ignored or overlooked. And you would be one of the few artists who would uh, follow up on that. What this next picture will be in your current exhibition is that? Yes, true? it will. It's it's the sacrifice of Isaac, and uh, it's uh, I, I'm, I I did a thing like that for a multiplicity of reasons. For one thing, uh, murder is implied, and man's inhumanity to man. I mean, even his own son. The other thing is that uh, it involves certain Renaissance values that I believe in, like the, uh, like, uh, like the whole uh, discipline of uh, drawing and painting the human figure in, in, uh, in a uh, meaningful or dramatic way, whether I've done it or not. Well, you certainly have, and uh, here we have another uh, re religious figure that will be in your current exhibition. It, it seems that you almost have two poles in your art, a quiet, contemplative, religious work where solitary religious figures appear he almost seemingly more calmly more carefully painted than the more riotous political social rough harem scarum life outside that you uh, detest in so many ways if that's not too strong a word are, are these the two poles of your creative existence in a sense I guess just about I mean it, this has an in, interesting reference to the drawing I did 45 years ago the rab two rabbis 
Yes, I see no reason to get off that dime, no matter who <laughs> says to do it, you know? Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, what is this one? This uh, next picture will also be included in your exhibition at Kennedy Galleries, November 8th. Uh, it's a, this is a, an oil and pastel on paper. And uh, I saw a, uh, I guess he was a Chicano. He, he was, uh, not a Chicano, a uh, Hispano, I believe they, they say, being, being arrested on the subway train. And uh, that was the motivation for it. And, uh, and uh, some of it is my own confusion. He's not a very good guy. The cop is not a very bad guy. So, mm -hmm. so it, it, the coin can flip either way in many yeah. cases. You astound me because uh, I don't know if the people viewing have seen the very excellent movie on Jack Levine by that title, Jack <coughs> Levine, painting The Witch's Sabbath in 1963, but you do not use models or very rarely use models uh, I wonder, could you discuss that in relation to the picture we're looking at now? How do you m paint such a convincing, uh, convincingly solid figure without a model? Well, I know a lot of rules. Well, I think you go beyond rules in your painting. <laughs> and there's a lot of trial and error. Right. And there's a lot of improvisation and, uh, and uh, uh, rejections and new improvisations. And, and finally, I, I uh, get something that... that uh, Perhaps I had in mind in the first place. I work it out. It evolves through yeah. knowledge and understanding yeah. and experience and so forth. Yeah, obviously, I'm painting people that I wouldn't associate with half the time. You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's an irony, isn't it? You're, yeah. When you're so closely associated with them in your studio in that sense. But we have one minute uh, left, Mr. Levine. The show has gone very, very rapidly. Uh, what is this harem, political harem scarum? in uh, or seeing gathering taking place here. I saw this, uh, this truck with, with people who were electioneering on it. So uh, it is, it, actually, it's the back of a truck. And, uh, and this is called uh, Bandwagon. And somebody's holding up a sign saying four more years. <laughs> and uh, I understand that he, uh, he uh, didn't uh, make the full four years. Which, oh, which one, who, who's being involved here? Is it directed toward a... Well, I think it was the uh, previous president. Oh, it was a previous yeah, president. Yeah, he didn't last out, no, although he, he was re-elected. I, I was going to say that to sign four more years implies just sort of a hopeless desperation. <laughs> no matter who's involved, we have to put up with them for four more years. No, that's not the way they felt about it. They were very cheery about it. I was not. No, there was a certain, there was a certain grimness implied in the, in the painting. Uh, again, uh, we have to close, but we have been speaking with Mr. Jack Levine, uh, the foremost living American painter who has a show of his recent work since 1972 to be held at the Kennedy Galleries in New York City on West 57th Street starting November 8th. And I guarantee you, you aren't going to want to miss it because he is one of the few people who is reacting to life, responding to people, responding to his own feelings and emotions about things, and is not using a paint roller to turn out wallpaper. <laughs> this has been artist and critic Jack Levine has been our guest. I'm Don Gray. Good afternoon. Bye-bye.